upon the word of God it's always good isn't it and share the word of the Lord I started from Revelation chapter 1 and I and I said how that God had called us made us kings and priests unto God and his father is there in verse 6 of Revelation chapter 1 and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father and to him be glory and dominion forever and forever but I said at that time that to come into kingship and a priesthood you'll always find that there's opposition you're not going to get there like Mac was saying this morning you're not going to get there just eating peaches and cream you're going to you're only going to get there by a battle there's always a battle in the things of God because the enemy never wants you to ascend to the throne realm. The enemy's always out to uh, stop you from rising up in God. That's why you had a hard time to get out of bed this morning or something, you know. That's truth, isn't it? And so there's always, you know, a battle uh, going on. But the Bible uh, shows to us, and I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And it's nice to see our sister from Queensland with us today. God bless you. God bless you, sister. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8, verses 28. And I want to read a, a little way down. <clears throat> and we know that all things work together for good. Now that's pretty hard to believe. Is it? It's hard to believe when you're going through problems. And you're going through trials, it's hard to believe that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are called according uh, to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of, the, of, his, of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I'll just jump down a little way so we won't take up too much time with this. In um, verse 34 now, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution 
or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for thy sakes we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter, nay, in all these things. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height or depth and nor any other creatures shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> so when we look at this we see the power of God who is able to keep you and the power of God who is able to keep me who is able to thwart the powers of darkness uh, which come against you uh, to stop you from coming to become a true priest and a true king of God. You know, God's hand is upon us today. Bless the Lord. And I've taken this morning uh, the, the life of King David and just portions of his life shows to us of the mighty power of God which is able to keep you uh, from falling as you go on unto uh, kingship. Now, in the, if you read uh, uh, through the first Samuel and second Samuel, you'll see this 21 times there where, the, where Saul... Uh, tries to take the life of David. Tries to take. But it was through jealousy in his heart uh, that Saul tries to take the life of David. And you know, uh, the enemy is jealous over you. He's jealous uh, that you are going to have a higher position and you have a higher position than what he has. He's jealous because the powers of darkness are placed under your feet. And jealousy always leads to murder. You know, it, it sort of can come to, to become very murderous, can't it? And if we look at the life of Saul and David, we can see, we'll turn there to 1 Samuel chapter 18, just for a moment. And if you read uh, there in that chapter, you'll see how that the women come out. Well, you know, if anything will make someone else jealous, it's when the women start singing about, you know, another. And of course, here it is. Here's the, the women come out. The, the battle has been uh, raging against the Philistines and they've been uh, beaten. They've been conquered. And they're returning home. Saul is returning home uh, with, uh, with David. And the women come out and they began to sing. And they began to sing and said, well, Saul had slain his thousands and I could see him just sticking out his chest when he heard that. But when he heard uh, that David, his ten thousands, then his balloon had uh, busted. It really went down. All his ego had dropped. And do you know what the Bible says? It says there in verse 9 that Saul eyed David from that day forward. Something went into his heart. There was an arrow which pierced into Saul's heart that day from that day forward. And we see Actually, what happened to Saul, he wants to make it happen to David. And what he does, if you look at verse 11 of that chapter, uh, you'll see there where Saul casts a javelin to smite David to the wall. Now, it wasn't the last time uh, that, that uh, David, that he tries to kill David, but David had just flips out of the way. But Saul tries on a couple of uh, uh, occasions. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 10, you'll see again that there's a javelin thrown. And I brought out some things about that javelin and about what Saul was, what David was doing, and what was, and what David, how uh, how David, how Saul was acting at that time. 
and how he had a javelin in his hand. And uh, I'll, perhaps I'll just give you a little bit of it. 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 10. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with a javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence. And he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Now let's go to another scripture found in uh, verse 20. No. It's where he tries the second time uh, to pin David to the wall. 20 and 24, let me just pick this up, see if it is. Uh, well, it's about, uh, about Saul, at any rate. Saul is there and he's prophesying. Where is it? Th right up, yeah. Yes, here it is. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers and they prophesied like what? No, not that one. No, not there. But at any rate, here's, it speaks about where Saul was prophesying. He is prophesying. While he's prophesying, he gets a javelin, he holds a javelin in his hand. And, be, and while he's there, he, 23, 3. 20, 33, is it, Ian? Oh, yeah, here it is. In, uh, this is uh, chapter 20, verse 32 we read. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him, or oh, that was at, uh, uh, that's with a Jonathan, to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father. Uh, but it goes on, and it speaks of how, how that Saul has a javelin in his hand while he's prophesying. And I was brought out of how, you know, that we can, we can use the javelin when we prophesy to slay our brethren. David was singing and he still was, and still, you know, uh, Saul had the, had the uh, javelin in his hand to kill him. And you know, it's pretty awful, isn't it, when you think of things like that which can take place. All right, so we went into these sort of things the other night. Was it 1810? Well, we'll leave it at 1810. Righto. Now, where, where we got to uh, was in chapter 19, and verse 20. I want you to go there this morning as we're going to pick this up and we're going to go on. And Saul sent messengers, and this is, I've, I've got as far as this. And Saul sent messengers to take David when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them. The Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied. Now here's these messengers going to take David. Right? The Spirit of the Lord uh, comes upon them. Well, their errand was absolutely uh, thwarted. They couldn't do anything. The Spirit of God now had touched them and they were useless as far as Saul was concerned. No more the enemy uh, of David uh, couldn't do anything with these fellas because the Spirit of God had uh, came upon them. Right? -o? And then uh, Saul... Uh, heard about this, it was told Saul, and so Saul sent another lot, another lot of messengers to take David. But David was still in the same place, and he was still under the same anointing, and they go up uh, to, to take David, and you know what? The Spirit of the Lord came upon them too. And they, and, and the Spirit of the Lord rendered them useless. So David didn't, um, Saul didn't give up. He said, oh, well, I'll send another group. So he sends another group up, three groups. If you read here in chapter 20, uh, 19 and verse 20 down, you'll see where there were three groups which were sent up, right? 
and they all came under the ministration of the Spirit of God and God worked in them and they couldn't take David. So Saul said, well, it's no good sending anyone else. I'm the only one strong enough to be able to go up there and take him and this is what happened. And he went, in verse 23, and he went thither to Naoth in Ramah and the Spirit of the Lord, God was upon him also and he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. Now is the Spirit of God, this is on Saul. But Saul sat to kill the servant of the Lord. You'd never believe it, would you? How that one could get under an anointing, the Spirit of God, and yet God allowed that. Right over in verse 24, and he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore they say is Saul also among the prophets. Now listen, God will allow you to be touched by the Spirit of the Lord even although you've got anguish, even although you've got malice and hatred in your heart towards a brother, but the Spirit of the Lord, you can still be prophesying, right? You can still have a javelin in your hand. You can still be going, you know, to even uh, to deceive your brother and to do all sorts of things to him. But I'll tell you something. God lets you feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God will let you drink of the Spirit of God and even give you revelation by the Spirit of the Lord. What for? That you might turn from that. And I believe the Spirit of God came upon Saul at this time to give him opportunity to turn away from that which he was doing like the three messengers that went before him and those three messengers that went before him and they were the pattern for Saul to follow. But he failed to see it. But I'll tell you something, you'd never believe that a man uh, could be so overcome by the Spirit of the Lord that he would lay down and strip himself naked and lay all day and all night uh, before Samuel, the mighty prophet of the Lord, and still do what he was wanting to do was to slay David. Do you know what? When Saul stripped himself, he wouldn't have done that just be felt because he felt hot. He did it because that's how he felt in the spirit. That's how he felt. He felt naked. You know, when you come in to where the Spirit of God is moving and where the Holy Ghost is really speaking, what happens? You feel unclean. You feel unclean. And here Saul, he just stripped himself of his, of his garments and yet he failed. Even after it was over and he had felt the Spirit of God upon him and he prophesied. I'd love to have heard that prophecy to see what was coming out of his mouth. I would have loved to be a spider on the wall or something just listening to that prophecy which was coming out of his mouth. All right. But you know what? There was another man named Saul too in the New Testament. And we're just going to jump over there for a minute in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And here he is in Acts chapter 9. Here he is, just like Saul of the Old Testament and he's going up and this time he's going to take the, uh, the, the Christians, the followers of Christ, he's going to take them captive. But this one was a little different to the Saul of the, of the Old Testament. 
We see when God revealed himself unto him and God spoke unto him, he fell to the earth just like Saul of old. And he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I wonder if the prophetical word which was coming out of Saul of the Old Testament was Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? When he was chasing the servant of God had to destroy him. But he said at this time, this is uh, Saul which, which came to become Paul he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now there was a repentance here. There wasn't a repentance with Saul of old. But with this one, there was a repentance, wasn't there? And because there was a repentance, as he felt the Spirit of God come upon him, God was able to use him. God was able had to cause him to become the minister to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ giving the revelation of the church. Hallelujah. All right, so as I started to uh, see that concerning Saul, of old I thought to myself, how often the Spirit of God has touched our lives and yet we will uh, still allow things, you know, to come up within us rather than surrendering them unto the Lord and saying, Lord, what will you have me to do? All right, back to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. As we go to chapter 20, we see how Jonathan made, makes a covenant with David. Jonathan loved David as his own soul, the word of God says. Jonathan was a real close brother, real friend. Bless the Lord. And so Jonathan comes to David and they make a covenant between them. That covenant was a mighty covenant. Verse 13, the Lord do so, wait a minute, yes, I'll read from verse 13. And the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do thee evil, then I will show it thee and send thee the way that thou mayest go in peace and the Lord be with thee as he has been with my father. Thou shalt not only while yet I live Show me the kindness of the Lord. This is Jonathan talking to David. That I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. Not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one have from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemy. And they go on and, and they, they go over that again, that covenant which they make. Right, oh, in, in, chapter, in chapter 21, you'll find that, that uh, Jonathan was one that, you know, showed David that Saul was really after him, was going to try to kill him. And there was, you know, a plan which they carried out by the shooting of arrows. 
And David was going to know by what came forth out of the mouth of Jonathan uh, that uh, he was to flee. In verse 42, I'd like to read that again. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed and Jonathan went into the city. And then we find that David goes and he starts to flee and he comes to the high priest, he comes to the high priest which is Ahimelech in chapter 21. Then he asks for some bread and there was only the show bread which had been replaced by the hot bread, you know, that was available under the hand of, uh, on the hand, under the hand of Ahimelech. But there was one there which was doing and he was watching everything that was going on. He was the master of the, the herdsman of Saul. And we find that uh, this doing, he was, he was watching everything and he went back and he spoke to Saul and he sold out of Hemelech. The Bible shows to us that. But David goes on in chapter 22 when we find that David flees to the cave of Abdalam and all the people all the people gathered towards him and his brethren gathered around him and I'd like to read just those couple of verses there David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Abdalam and when his brethren all his father's house heard it they went down hither to him and every one uh, that was in distress and every one that was in debt and every one that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them and there were with him about 400 men. Mind you, David's on his way to the throne. He's on his way to the throne. He's gathering around him a people, people gathering around him and here they are of all sorts. The Bible uh, speaks to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 26 to 31. And I'd like to just read that. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 2. Now, 20, uh, chapter 1, 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. The base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now we, we haven't got anything to throw out our chest about because we're called unto God except that we are the redeemed of the Lord and that we are precious in the sight of, the, in the sight of God. Amen? And God loves us and that's great. And we can throw out our chest about that. But uh, I look at the Word of God here and I see that continually there's a battle. David is continually in a battle. He's all the time running. Saul's all the time after him. But you know what? There's brethren to help him along the way too. Isn't that good? Isn't it good to have a good brother? Hallelujah. Uh, to help him along the way uh, to kingship. And you always find uh, that God uh, gives you people that will stand alongside you. Amen. Because they're all going to come into that glorious city of David. Bless the Lord. And it's great. Hallelujah. All right? So, David, uh, remember I told you about Dewey. And Dewey goes to, uh, to Saul and starts to uh, beef out all the things which he saw when David asked for the, for the bread to eat. And he even told him about the, 
about the javelin or the spear which was underneath the ephod and was hanging on the wall which was given to David by the high priest. And so Saul says, oh well, bring all the priests down here. So he gets them all to come down. There was 85 of them and they come down and uh, when they come down, uh, Saul asks them, what, what does he mean by it? You know, what do they mean by it? By helping uh, their arch enemy, which was David. And at uh, any rate, Saul was so mad and so wild, he says to the footman alongside him, he says, I want you to uh, slay all those priests. Kill him, Himelech, and kill his sons. Get rid of them. They wouldn't do it. They weren't going to touch the priests of the Lord. See? They had more wisdom than what Saul had. They wouldn't do it. But here's this Duig, this traitor, this Judas, which was there, and he said, well, they, uh, Saul turned to him and said, you better do it, Duig. You better slay these priests and so he says all right I'll do it so he took his sword out he polished it up and made sure it was nice and sharp and he goes through it he kills 85 priests of the Lord or 84 I'm not sure whether it was 85 or 84 but you'll find there, there was one which escaped and that one was so necessary for that one to escape and when he escaped he went to, he fled to David. Now that priest, which was Abathar, he was in the same condition now as what David was in. He was a priest and he was fleeing. He got away. But when he went, he didn't go empty-handed. He took with him the ephod. The ephod was a garment which used to go down over the head, had a hole in the head, right over the sleeves, had a place here for their arms to come through and it just went down over the body, the main part of the body. All right, so we find that he goes down and uh, from that time forth, you'll find that David begins to seek counsel of the Lord. Why? Because he had the, the, the ephod. The ephod speaks to us of the anointing and the calling of a priest. And from that time forth we find that David starts to seek God and God starts to speak to him. And from then on, David never waited on his brethren to tell him, you know, when Saul was after him, he went before the Lord and the Lord started to speak to David. The anointing of God was upon him because he had the garment of the priest. I want to tell you today that the Holy Ghost is the greatest anointing which we can have to show us the way. Amen. It is the anointing of the priesthood and you need the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon you. Had to get true direction from God, don't you? And David had true direction from God uh, because there was this one, uh, this, this priest which had escaped and he came in the ephod. And now God, now David was able to commune with God and David was still surrounded. He got surrounded on many occasions still. But God showed him the way out. And one time, he came to a mountain. Saul knew, thought, well, I can get this fellow now. And he came to this mountain. And the mountain was called, let me give it to you, oh yes, Salahem Malakoth. It is in chapter 23 and verse 28. And when Saul returned from pursuing David, after David had went again against the Philistine, therefore they call the place Salem, Mala, whatever it is, Malachoth, all right? Now, it was a mountain, but David, if you look up in, in verse 25, you'll see where David came down into a rock. And I want to tell you this morning that Jesus Christ is our rock. And on the way, you know, to kingship, you've got to be hidden in the rock. 
Amen. You need the, the anointing. You need the touch of the Holy Ghost. You need the word of the Lord. You need to be hide hidden in the rock. Bless the Lord. If you're going to be protected uh, from your enemy. Right oh, in that place, that funny word down there in verse 28 means the rock of division. The rock of division. It was the place where God separated. Now listen, how did he do it? <coughs> David was on, we'll say on the right side of the mountain. Saul thought, well, I'll go on the back side of the mountain for he won't see me on the back side of the mountain and we can surround him. But God sent a messenger. God stirred up the Philistines. And God sent a messenger had to Saul and said, Saul, the Philistines are attacking our homeland, our home. He says, you better come and fight. So Saul had to turn his army away. When they just about had David absolutely caught, what happened? God raised up a standard. Hallelujah. Isn't that mighty? When you see the plan of God, our God, you know, can, can look after us and bring us through. doesn't matter uh, just how the enemy thinks he's got you. There, you know, God makes a way of escape. The Bible says that. He makes a way of escape. Well, I want to go a little bit further this morning. I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. We could go on there further, but I would like you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9 because I'd like to get through this part of it. 2 Samuel chapter 9. <clears throat> and I think that this is one of the most beautiful pictures, you know, that we could read about as we read about, you know, Mephibosheth. It's so great. Here's David. And we read here in verse chapter 9, verse 1, and David said, Is there yet... Oh, this is after David had ascended to the throne. And he says, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness? for Jonathan's sake. So here David wanted to show kindness. Jonathan was continually upon his heart. The love which Jonathan had for him, David wanted to repay that love uh, to any of Jonathan's seed or Saul's seed David wanted to show clemency and he wanted to show favour just for the sake of Jonathan. Now, David is upon the throne at this time, gets to the throne, <clears throat> and it's a type of God upon his throne the Lord Jesus Christ upon his throne. And here's David, he wants to show clemency, he wants to show compassion, he wants to show love uh, to his arch enemy, the seed of his arch enemy. Do you know what? You were the seed, not the true seed of the Lord at one time, you were the seed of the enemy. The one that wanted to slay the Lord Jesus Christ. You belonged to that seed at one time, weren't you? But God has dealt with you through grace. And he's reached out to you. Amen. And he's reached out to me. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. 
And so David is one that takes the initiative of finding some of the seed of Saul through Jonathan, and, and of course Jonathan's in that because he is the son of, of uh, Saul. But it wasn't any of Saul's uh, uh, progeny. It wasn't any, anything that they could do to, uh, to sort of help them along the way that David uh, wanted to uh, show them kindness. And you know, it's God who makes the first move towards you and makes the first move towards me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And through the gospel, the Lord has, is reaching out to you and he's reaching out to me. We all are like sheep and we've gone astray. And we've turned everyone to our own way. But you know, the Lord reaches out in love and compassion uh, towards you. He seeks that which is lost, the Bible says. And furthermore, if you look at the Word of God, uh, you'll see that God is always seeking those that are lost. He hasn't given up. He's still saving, bless the Lord. He's still reaching, you know, out to, to bring in the souls of men that they might come and sit in the kingdom and feast at the table of the Lord. Why, there was a great call to Abraham. And God called Abraham. It was God that sought out, sought out Abraham. And what did Abraham do? Abraham had became the father of those who have faith. He became, you know, as it were, the beginning. Because, in a way, the beginning of the church, because, in a way, that you and I, you know, are grafted in as a seed of Abraham. Bless the Lord. It was God that saw Jacob when Jacob was out wandering and and God spoke to Jacob as he laid his head upon the, upon the stone. God gave him visions and it was God that spoke to him. Mighty call of God upon his life. If you look at Moses in the wilderness there of Midian, it was God who spoke to Moses, called Moses. God still calls you and he calls me. In the same manner, it was God who called uh, Saul of Tarshish. But here in chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, here's Mephibosheth, being a descendant of Saul, he could not really expect clemency. Not really. What Saul had really been after David. But I expect that uh, Mephibosheth, he would have been hiding, he would have been in fear of his own life because he was one who had lost his inheritance or his heritage. But God's grace is mighty for he seeks Mephibosheth never had anything to offer to David. Nothing. He never had a thing to offer to David. But David wanted to show kindness unto him. And David said that I might show kindness. Beautiful scripture here. That I may show him kindness. For Jonathan's sake. Hallelujah. Now, you might think, well, that's nice of David to show kindness unto Mephibosheth. But he did it because of Jonathan's sake. 
So David found a reason outside of himself to show kindness unto the seed of Saul because of Jonathan. And do you know what the Bible says? God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32 Just as David wanted to show kindness unto Mephibosheth because of Jonathan's sake, God, the Father, has shown kindness unto you because of Jesus. That's why he's shown kindness unto you. Because God had promised him and you know it's beautiful when you look at it. And you see that, you see David and Jonathan had made a beautiful covenant together. That David would show kindness unto Jonathan's seed. And that was in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel. Jonathan was the mediator between Saul and David. And you can read of that covenant as you go through. And so David swears in that covenant that, he'll, that he will look after the seed, the Jonathan's seed, when he comes to the throne. And David's mercy was covenant relationship, was a mercy which was backed up by covenant. And you know, the mercy which God has towards you and to me is backed up by a blood covenant. A tremendous covenant. So Mephibosheth receives mercy, receives favor, not because of any worthiness of himself. He receives on the basis of a covenant which was between David and and uh, and Jonathan and so it is with us we have no personal claims right but it is because of the covenant because God has promised his son and God has promised Abraham a seed. Amen. And it's because of the covenant that you stand where you are today in Christ. No other way. You haven't got it, not because you're good looking, that you got there. Not because you got broad shoulders, that you get there. You get there only on the basis of a covenant which God has made. Hallelujah. And that's just so mighty. Of the everlasting covenant that God makes his people perfect in every good work to do his purposes. Now the scripture found in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Right out, so Mephibosheth, the name Mephibosheth means a shameful thing. A shameful thing. concerning the natural man in Isaiah 64 and verse 6 we're all as an unclean thing a shameful thing polluted by sin depraved and corrupt opposed to God's will our hearts are desperately the Bible says desperately wicked until we get a new heart our consciences were seared as with, like as with a hot iron. Our strength is spent in serving the enemy. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Our righteousness in the sight of God was as filthy rags. A shameful thing. And yet God had mercy to a corrupt seed. Isn't it amazing? A corrupt seed. He has mercy. And Mephibosheth was a fugitive from David. Oh, he, he went and hid. 
If you look at 2 Samuel chapter 4, 2 Samuel chapter 4, in verse 4, and Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul. And Jonathan, out of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. Came to pass as he made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame in his feet. And his name was Mephibosheth. So he fled. They were anxious moments for that nurse had to take him up. But how did he receive his injury? How did he get it? What did we read about then? By a fall. How did you get your injury? By the fall. When our first our parents uh, fell in Adam, it was a fall which caused you to be a cripple in both feet. And you couldn't walk the ways of truth. You couldn't walk the ways of Zion. You couldn't walk the ways of holiness and purity. And you became a, shape, a shameful thing. And it was just the same as Mephibosheth. He fell. Not because of his own fault, but because of someone else dropped him. See, we've been dropped. Not because of ourselves, but because of someone else, which was Adam. Hallelujah. So Mephibosheth was lame in both feet. It's the same as the natural man outside of Christ. He's lame. He can't run in the paths of the Lord. He's a spiritual cripple. He's without strength and without hope. But you can come unto the Father through Jesus Christ. Bless the Lord. If you're drawn by the Spirit of the Lord, this is the day to get right with God. So Mephibosheth became a cripple through the court, through a fall. Hallelujah. But also, the Bible says, speaking of, we'll take that, we'll take him, and Mephibosheth as the flesh man. Romans 8, 8 says, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, Mephibosheth resided at a place, not in Jerusalem, but he resided in a place called Lodabar in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 4. Look at it. And the king said unto him, Where is he? This is talking about Mephibosheth. And Zeba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Makar, the son of Emelech in Lodabar. And Lodabar means a place of no pasture. And you know what? The world uh, thinks that it's got everything when it's just a pauper. They've got absolutely nothing, a place of no pasture. And here's this poor crippled guy, he hiding away like Adam was behind the, behind the trees of the garden, and there he is, without strength, and he hasn't got any pasture uh, to feed on. Hallelujah. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Isaiah 57, 27, the wicked are like a troubled sea. No rest, discontented and dissatisfied. No food for the soul. They live in a great howling wilderness as far as the things of the spirit are concerned. Millions live in a place called Lodabar where there's no pasture. And they seek, seek the, the pasture or they seek their satisfaction in sport or the pleasures of the world. Seeking it in some pursuit which is really never going to take them anywhere in God. Why? Because they despise the true bread. I, don't, I just want to tell you this. Could you just turn with me to 
the same chapter in verse 7 now. Verse 6. Thou went Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David. He fell on his face. He fell on his face. Look what it says. And did reverence and David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. He calls his sheep by name. And David said unto him, Fear not. You know what? This is what the Lord does to you and to me. Even although you've been rebellious, even although you're an unclean thing, even although you've been living outside of Christ, he says, Fear not. I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan's sake. I will surely show thee kindness for Jesus' sake. And will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, that thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And I want to tell you today that God is restoring all unto his people. Everything has been restored unto you and to me if we will just seek God. Hallelujah. And look what it says. And ye shall eat bread at my table continually. Isn't that a mighty thing? That God says to you and God says to me. He says, ah, listen, my table is full today for you. And what did he do? This is Mephibosheth. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? He felt so unclean, and yet here's the king having compassion upon him. Here's a cripple, and yet the king is saying, Listen, you can eat at my table. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? Let's just read on. I just want to get to the bottom of this and I'll finish. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's sons may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth... Thy master's son shall eat bread always at my table. Amen. And yet Mephibosheth was like a king because the servants of Saul had to minister unto Mephibosheth. Now look what it says. Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all, my Lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Now listen, can you imagine that you are crippled in your two feet, can't walk the ways of the Lord, an unclean thing? Unable to eat to the uh, eat the things of the Spirit of God, God comes along and He touches your life, and He says, "Listen, I'll get it. I'll allow you uh, to come and eat of my at my table, always." Now listen, when He sat at the table, His feet was covered, and He ate. Isn't that beautiful? that the crippled feet was covered when he sat at the table and he was eating at the, at the hand of the king. I think that's a beautiful story. I think God is very gracious to think that God you know, made, way, made provision for Mephibosheth because of the love of Jonathan. Because he had made a covenant. And listen, I want to tell you today that we are in a marvelous position in Christ. We can eat at the table of the Lord and our, all our crippled walk is all covered by the table of the Lord. He's given us a body which is prepared for us 
a lamb of God upon the table. And we can eat of it. And he says, if you, li if you eat of it and drink of it, you shall live forever. Let's pray. Father, this morning we come before you and we behold the glory of God. Yea, Lord, in type and in shadow we see, O oh God, those things which thou hast purposed for the sons of God. Yea, that we might sit at the king's table as a son of God. Oh, we bless you today, Lord. Father, we thank you, yea, for the word of truth which thou hast revealed. We thank you for the revelation. We thank you, O oh God, that you're speaking to us as your people. And this morning we rise to give you thanks, Lord, for we recognize your goodness. We recognize your compassion. We recognize your love this morning, Father, because thou art a good God unto us and we bless your name. Thank you for the call of God upon our lives. Thank you for seeking us out, Lord, that we might be your people. We praise thee in the mighty name of the Lord. And we pray, Lord, that we shall never lose sight even of Mephibosheth and that which happened unto him because, Lord, the day comes, yea, when we shall, O oh God, continually dwell, yea, in the fullness of your presence forever and forever. And so we give you thanks today, Lord. We praise and glorify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we bless you this morning. We glory in thy name today, O oh Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, bless him. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. A joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye land. And I live by the power of the Holy Ghost, when the Spirit of the Lord is I free. Oh, with the high praises of God in my mouth and a two-edged sword in my hand. I'm gonna march right up to the victor's side, right into Canaan's land. Oh, with the high praises of God in my mouth and a two-edged sword in my hand. I'm gonna march right up to the victor's side. Right into Canaan's land Oh, with the high praises of God in my mouth And a two-edged sword in my hand I'm gonna march right off to the victory's side Right into Canaan's land Hosanna, Hosanna Hosanna in the highest Hosanna, Hosanna Hosanna in the highest Lord, we lift up your name We lift your name your name, through our hearts will I pray, be exalted, O Lord my God, Hosanna to the highest, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the King of kings, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the King of kings. Lord, we lift up your name. With our hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna 
this morning you know jesus is joy jesus is true joy it's joy unspeakable amen and it comes from within as we abide in him and there's a joy i want you to pull out your hankies this morning especially if they're clean if they're used you can leave them in your pocket <laughs> we'll pull out your hankies and we're going to wave our flags this morning because there's joy in our hearts 
joy is the flag flying high from the castle of my heart, from the castle of my heart, from the castle of my heart. Joy is the flag flying high from the castle of my heart, for the king is in residence there. So let it fly in the sky, let the whole world know, let the whole world know, let the whole world know, let it fly in the sky, let the whole world know, that the king is in residence there. Joy is a flag flying high from the castle of my heart, from the castle of my heart, from the castle of my heart. Joy is a flag flying high from the castle of my heart, for the king is in residence there. So let us fly in the sky, let the whole world know, let the whole world know, let the whole world know, let us fly in the sky, let the whole world know, that the king is in residence there. One more time, joy the flag, flying high. The castle of my heart, from the castle of my heart, from the castle of my heart, joy flag flying high from the castle of my heart, for the king is in residence there. So let it fly in the sky, let the whole world know, let the whole world know, let the whole world know, let it fly in the sky, let the whole world know. That the king is in residence there And if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead While in you, while in you If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead While in you, while in you Oh, he shall quicken, yes he will, your mortal body My spirit that dwells in you, oh, he will pick in your mortal body by the spirit that dwells in you. And if the same spirit that raised Christ from the day dwells in you, dwells in you. And if the same spirit that raised Christ from the day dwells in you, dwells in you. Your mortal body by the spirit that dwells in you. Oh, he shall quicken your mortal body by the spirit that dwells in you. For if the same spirit that raised by from the dead dwells in you, dwells in you. If the same spirit that raised by from the dead. While in you, while in you, oh, he shall quicken your mortal body by the spirit that dwell in you. Oh, he shall quicken your mortal body by the spirit that dwell in you. We are the branches Keep us abiding in you You are the vine We are the branches Keep us abiding in you And we'll go Abiding in you, you are 
the vine. We are the branches, keep us abiding in you, and we'll go. from the Spirit of the Lord this morning. I'm going to be touched by the Spirit of the Lord. All we have to do is open up our hearts and let them come in. Just let them touch us this morning. We're going to sing that song as we go into a time of praise. Touch me now, Holy Spirit. You can make that personal this morning. Touch me now, Holy Spirit. Even if you don't know the Lord, say, Lord, touch me that I might know you as my God. Touch me now, Holy Spirit, and me with your hand. Come through my heavy burden, set 
Father, we do thank you this morning that thou art a mighty God, thou art the healer, thou art the restorer, thou hast brought us redemption, and thou hast brought us to thy mountain, O Lord, that we might dwell even in the secret place of the Most High God. Hallelujah. We bless you this morning. And we pray, Father, that as we leave this building this morning, leave this building this morning, Lord, that your word would have taken effect within us, Lord, and caused us to grow just that little bit more, Lord, because we're a people, Father, who desire to know thy truth, desire to know thy word, Lord. And, Father, we just pray for those who are sick, especially our sister Diane, oh God, that thy healing rays would touch her at this time, Father, and raise her up once again, that we might hear a voice in the midst of the congregation praising the Lord, her God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Don't forget that, that uh, Diane is having her second treatment in the hospital today, and she needs your prayers. She needs all of our prayers to help her through this time. Amen. And there's a prayer meeting tonight out at the back at 6 o'clock, out the back, and there's been a great time of blessing. And do come. You're most welcome to come. And then on Tuesday night, there's a uh, meeting at uh, Victor Gretsch's up at the farm. And you're quite welcome there. And Wednesday night, there's a Bible study here, the regular time. I don't know if there's a woman's meeting this week. Yes, there's no woman's meeting. And of course, next Sunday, back here again. Hallelujah. Well, I've got a letter from Phil to read out to the congregation. I know you've all been waiting eagerly for that. That's from Phil and Candace. To Clem and Esther, our dearly beloved, and to the Church of the Firstborn, the General Assembly, grace, mercy, and peace from the Lord, from, from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank God always for you, for you, brethren, because your faith grows abundantly and your love of, and the love of every one of you towards each other abounds. We praise God for your faith and patience in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. We pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of the faith with power. Brethren, one sows, one plants, but God gives the increase. Here in Dawson's Creek at Bethel, the Lord is increasing his servant. I am now to minister to the whole congregation on Sunday mornings and evenings and continue teaching and also preaching at outdoor church meetings in the local shopping mall car park. Our cup is full. Bless the Lord. I have also been asked to sing again. The Lord can use any vessel to his glory and I praise his name that as we, his chosen, are steadfast and unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord, the Father's business, that we may know that our labour is not in vain in the Lord. Our precious, our precious brethren, we exhort you to labour not for the meat which perishes, but for the meat which endures unto everlasting life, which, is, which the Son of Man shall give to you. Amen. The seasons come and go. Here in North America, schools are out for the summer break, two months. So holiday time is rampant, comparable to our Christmas holiday period. Motor homes pass through the town daily on their way to Alaska. Dawson Creek is the start of the Alaskan Highway. So many pass through. Feels strange to me, but I'm learning the customs, even starting to talk a little like the Canadians. Set me free, Lord, he's got in brackets there. <laughs> the seed rains have, have come and the farmers here are rejoicing as their crops are booming and other harvests. Candace is still spoiling me. She is one in a thousand. Bless the Lord for her good gifts. Finally, our holy brethren, he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to whom will I give power 
over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and I will give him the morning star bless the king of kings and the lord of lords amen it must be the same spirit over in Canada the same spirit of the lord isn't it because he's talking about the morning star just as if we've been hearing about the morning star and do pray for Philip and Candace that the lord would bless them and increase them take this off I was just thinking about uh, after give the communion this morning and it was uh, I was thinking about it during the week I thought it's great when your opportunity comes to talk about the things of the Lord that he's shown unto you you know and it just reminded me of